chapter 5, verses 10, all the way to chapter 6, verse 6. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefits are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a labourer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance, their abundance permits them no sleep. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction and anger. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink and to find satisfaction in a toilsome labour under the sun during the few days, during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their Lord. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possession and ability to enjoy them, to accept their Lord and be happy in their toil, this is the gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life. Why? Because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. I have seen another evil under the sun and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions and honour so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them and strangers enjoy, enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and lives many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never, though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does the man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place. Some of us may have heard the story of an old man. And he is a miser. This old miser who was on, unfortunately, fell sick and he was on his deathbed. So while he was on his deathbed, he called together three of his very best friends and he gave to each of them an envelope containing $30,000 cash, hard cash, $30,000 each. So the three friends, one of them is a doctor, the other one is a lawyer, the last one is a church pastor. And they were supposed to throw the money into his grave during the burial in a funeral so that he could take this money together with him in death. And so they did as instructed. And after the funeral, the three friends gathered together for a chit-chat over tea. And at the tea time, the pastor, being convicted, confessed. He said, I have a confession to make. I did not throw in the full amount of 30000 I took 10000 out for the church building fund. Then the next one, the lawyer said, and the doctor said, me too. I, I, I took 20000 for the extension of my hospital wing. And to this, a lawyer looked at the two of them with a look of indignation and said, shame on you, stealing from a dead person, not me. I wrote him a check for the full 30000 and threw it into his grave. <laughs> there is something so powerful 
something so intriguing, something so mystical about money, isn't it? Money is so seductive. For money, what will people do? A man will kill another person. A son will sue his father. We read many cases, right, in the papers of children suing each other. For money, a woman can violate her body and a man can sell his soul. And it is for this reason, right, why Jesus spoke more about money than any other subject during his ministry when he was on earth. And for this reason, the Scriptures, the Holy Bible, is truly the best economics book for all time. Why? Time may change. Eras will come and go. The economy fluctuates high and low. Currency, uh, the stock markets will just appreciate and depreciate. Share prices goes up and down. But the thing is this, the principle of God's words never ever change. So blessed is the man or the woman who will apply God's principle in this area of money management. So this evening, I would like to, for all of us to continue to reflect on the words of King Solomon, who spent quite a fair bit of his life, of his time, observing life. In the past few weeks, we have seen he has looked at life, we have seen that he has looked at different aspects of life, he has seen the, the world of politics, he has looked at social issues, he saw the religious practice in a temple, and he also found that relationships are not trustworthy, among many other things he was observing. And one of the areas he observed greatly was this area of money, riches, and wealth. And for any other person, King Solomon is very, very qualified. Why? Because he's a very, very, very wealthy man himself. So as he looked at riches, money, and wealth, Right from the passage we just read, we just I want us to examine what King Solomon recorded for us, his four observations about money and riches. So I want to take a look at the four ob- his four observations about wealth. So as you look at money and wealth, the first thing he observed that there is a materialistic grip of wealth. Here, if we, uh, Ecclesiastes 5 tells us, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Right? As, good, as, good, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Have you ever also, have you heard this story also about this lady who called many, a few, quite, quite a number of churches and to find out if any of these churches would be willing to conduct a funeral for her dog so precious to her that just died. Everyone that she called to, every one of them just laughed at the request except for an Anglican pastor who asked her, we don't really do this, but I'd like to know, why would you want a funeral for your dog? Then she replied, oh, I love my dog very much and would like to give him a proper burial. To this, this pastor replied, he said, I'm sorry but we don't do funerals for dogs. And the lady then said, I'm so sorry to hear that. I was actually prepared to give $20,000 to any church who would be willing to do so. And immediately the pastor said, I didn't know, you didn't say, that you have an Anglican dog. (laughs) Of course we would do it. That's what the pastor said. So wealth... Money has such a gripping upon men, isn't it? If you look around, the love for money is really gripping the whole of our society and believers of Christ Jesus are not spared. 
that there are some of us who are not careful, we will be seduced to bow down on our knees to this false god of mammon. And sometimes when this thing grip us, right, it can be so strong that we act irrationally. In fact, Richard Foster in his book, Money, Sex and Power, he puts it this way. He says, compulsive extravagance is a modern mania. The contemporary lust for more, more and more is clearly psychotic. It has completely lost touch with reality. Those who lose the battle with materialism are characterized by anxiety and the pursuit of the temporal. So true, isn't it? And no wonder, right? A modern man comes home every night. A modern woman too comes home every night tired, fragmented, drained, stressed, worn out, totally stressed out. And it is no wonder that by the time a typical executive reaches the age of 40, he, not just he only, he or she, right, is overworking, but they are under-relating. You are burned out physically, and most likely, their marriage has lost fire. And perhaps both spouses could be spiritually lukewarm. So here when materialism has done its worst, it will make slaves out of all of us because it is not enough. I need to have more, more and more. And the more we get, the more we want. Which is why the wise man said it right. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. I should be paid more. I should be paid more. We think to ourselves. And this too, he said, is totally meaningless. So this materialistic grip of wealth is there. No wonder Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So here, the first observation that King Solomon made as he looked at the world of wealth and riches, he saw the materialistic grip of wealth. The next observation that he made right, is that there is a danger of hoarding wealth. Here he says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through, many, through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Someone comes, everyone comes naked from the mother's womb, and as everybody, everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toll that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction and anger. So the wise man is telling us there is that danger of hoarding well and the danger is this, we will lose it. We will lose it, right? Not just once, but twice. We either lose it before we die or else we will definitely lose it when we die. It's a given. So one may have the ability to accumulate wealth, great wealth, but we cannot trust money for security. We can just, we can just lose them in one moment, Right? One wrong decision and everything is gone. That's why the wise man is accurate in his observation. He says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of others or wealth lost through some misfortune. That's why Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he said this. He rightly says that earthly goods are given to be used not to be collected because hoarding is idolatry. So even if you do not lose it in this life, we will definitely lose it when we die. You may recall the parable, one parable spoken by Jesus about a rich man who was certainly caught up in the red race, that he was gathering more and more, enough to be comfortable 
and he began to trust in his riches. So that man said to himself, I have ample goods laid up for the future. Now I will take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But yet God said to this man, You fool! This night your soul is required of you. Now to call someone a fool is really, they are very strong words, isn't it? And yet this man is called a fool. And the reason is why? He is a fool. That's why Jesus said to him correctly, right? a fool is not just someone who is stupid intellectually, but it is someone is referring to someone who has got no regard for who God is. Psalms 14 verse 1 tells us, The fool saith in his heart, There is no God. Even as believers, do we have a regard for God with our possessions? If we're not careful, we may be foolish too. I've said to you a couple of times about this multi-millionaire Paul Getty, right? The one that, that installed coin phones in all the gas in all the gas room. Do you know, do you know about his life? He was actually building one of the biggest, biggest mansions in the whole country. But you know what? Just two weeks before it was completed, Paul Getty died. It can happen to any of us. Or have you heard of this famous painter who had so many masterpieces that when he was dying, he hung them all around his bed, right? And keep on and, and he spent his final moments looking at all his paintings. He said, Oh, oh, I wish I have. I wish I don't have to leave you, but I have to. So here, the more we have, the colder the deathbed may be. Again, that's why the wise man said it right. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, that's how they depart. They take nothing from their toll that they can carry in their hands. The Bible, the world tells us, this is what the world tells us, easy come, easy go. But the Bible tells us, naked you come, naked you will go. So let us learn, let us learn to be warned and to realize that the, when it comes to wealth, it is really temporal. Which is why Jesus said to us in Matthew 6, Do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Then Paul echoes the same thing. She says, so we fix our eyes not on what is sin, but what is unseen. For what is sin is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Think about that for a moment. Listen to this not unfamiliar to many of us, money can buy medicine, but not wealth, not health. Money can buy us a house, not the warmth of a home. Money can buy us companions, but not really best of friends. Money can, can, buy, can buy us entertainment, but it cannot buy us real happiness and the joy in our heart. Money can buy us food, not necessarily a good appetite. Money can buy us a bed, not necessarily sound and restful sleep. Money can buy us a crucifix, definitely not a saviour. And money can buy us good life, but never ever eternal life. So look at it. One set is temporal, one set is eternal. One set is sin, the other is unseen. So here the wise man, first he noticed that there's a materialistic grip of wealth. Next he saw that there is a real grave danger of hoarding wealth. The third observation he made, a little bit different now, he saw that there is the delight of having wealth. This is what he said. This is what I observe to be good that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in a toilsome labor under the sun, 
during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions, the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because why? God keeps them occupied with the gladness of heart. So here the wise man goes on to say that despite the danger inherent of having wealth, wealth can certainly be a gift from God. That it is a blessing from God to be enjoyed by men. So if God has blessed you with a BMW, with a nice number, enjoy it. Right? And if God has blessed you with a Lexus 300, enjoy it too. Certainly, if God has blessed us with a Honda Civic, it should be enjoyed. Certainly. So do we have to feel guilty that we have been blessed? Unless those riches are, 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 are gained from a, a wrong and wicked way, but if God has blessed us and prosper, has prospered us, should we be guilty? No. It is better to be rich and, than to be poor. Correct? It's better to have money than have no money. That's a given. Right? So I want us to know that the Bible never ever teaches that we must be poor to be spiritual. In the 70s and 80s, the practice of the church was to give, to make sure that the, the pastors of the church don't, are, are paid poorly. Because they think that if they are poor, they'll be spiritual. But there's nothing in the Bible that says that. So we need to realize that we can. Not only should we can, we should enjoy the wealth that God has given to us if we see it as a gift from God. And if we see our wealth as a gift from God and not our own, then we will not fight. We will not fight to keep it. Just learn to live within our means. Then let us learn to be generous with the poor. Let us learn to be generous, investing them, right? That will gain for us treasures that thieves cannot steal, that moth cannot destroy. When we are building for ourselves treasures in heaven, Deuteronomy advises us, but remember the Lord your God, for it is He, it is He who gave you the ability to produce wealth. Job is a remarkable man in the Old Testament. He had everything, children, cattle, currencies, cars, country, homes, what have you. But then in a the moment, he lost all of them. And the amazing thing is that the moment he heard that all that he had were gone, his response was this, the Lord gave and the Lord take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? Why was he able to praise God in a time of great loss? I believe he strongly believed and he recognized that it was God who gave everything to him in the very first place. In other words, he recognized that his gift, his wealth, and all that he had was really a gift and a blessing from God. Therefore, the Lord gives and the Lord can take away. And when the Lord does take away, he can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. For his spouse didn't think like him. When all was lost, what did the wife tell him? The wife thought that everything he had was out of his own doing, so he told his, her husband, curse God and die. <laughs> so it's quite possible that between husband and wife, we have totally two different perspectives of wealth. We better get ourselves straightened and be together. So here, Job's perspective or philosophy is, is this. If God take it today, if God would take it today, I will bless him for giving them to me yesterday. A very good philosophy. And it was David Guyatt who said this. If God, uh, he says, it is not the fact that a man has riches that keeps him from the kingdom of God, but the fact that his riches have him. A very big difference. So here was Job, a man who has riches, but his riches never had him. He could say, praise the Lord, even when he lost all things. So, brothers and sisters, we must learn 
we must learn to have what I call, or what I like also, what Benny, Pastor Benny Ho said the same thing, live life with an open tongue. Right? That God is pleased to pour, God is pleased to give. And if God wants to take away, He don't have to pry, pry, open our hand. Oh, I refuse to give, I refuse to give. But we learn to say, Lord, my hands and my life are open. What you freely give to me, I'm, I'm happy to freely give back to you. So enjoy it without wealth possessing us. And if God should choose to take it away, right? There's no need for us to chop off our hands and take what He has put in. First, He saw the materialistic grip of wealth. Then He saw the danger of hoarding wealth. Then third, He saw, right? He saw the, the, de what is it? the delight of having wealth. And then lastly, He saw the grace of enjoying wealth. This is what He said, I've seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some, some people wealth. He didn't say God give all people. Huh? He said God gave some people wealth. We just wish they have given wealth to us, possession and honour, so that they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive a proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. So sometimes a man or woman may have wealth, but we may not be able to enjoy it because of poor health or because of bad and poor relationship. Like Andrew Carnegie, who was also a multi-millionaire, yet at, at that point he was so sickly, so sickly in his body, that at that point, at one time he was staying in a very glamorous hotel, overlooking outside, right? And he was feeling very sick. So out of the hotel window, he saw a construction worker during lunchtime, sitting by the side of the road, opening up his lunchbox and heartily enjoying his meal. And to this, Andrew Kennedy said this, I would give a million dollars just to have that man's appetite. He had tons of money. Someone said this, the poorest man or woman we can find or ever meet is a man and a woman who have, who have nothing but money. What's the point? If money is all we have, you can't enjoy them. You can't enjoy life. That's why he said it's better for a stillborn, right, than to be like this person. So the principle for us is this. Even to enjoy wealth that we have, may it be little, may it be much, it's a God-given grace. So when you go out for, for a meal this coming week, be thankful you have got teeth to chew. Be thankful you have got appetite to enjoy your meal. That is a gift of grace from God. So having a cup of kopi and say this is the best kopi I've drank for a long time, that is God's gift. And for those of us who are constantly complaining that we do not have enough, we're saying my car is too old, my house is too small, my iPad is outdated. Well, listen well. Learn to be thankful. Learn to be thankful. Realize that just to be able to enjoy life, little that we may have, is really a gift from God. That is so important. So out of his observation, what are some things we can apply? Three approaches we can take towards wealth. Well, the first one, be stingy. <laughs> right? When you go for lunch, you don't ever offer to pay, wait for someone to say, let me pay first. Or when you pay, when, when, when you buy things for people, you tell them it is $3.30, the person give you $3.20, you say, you still short me $0.10. Cent, huh? So you can choose to be stingy, if you like. Well, the flip side is, be a spendthrift, right? 
we must upgrade to the latest model or buy the things that we don't need with the money we don't have just to impress people that we don't like or don't know. Just spend freely, I don't care. Just buy and buy and buy. So, which is why those, those two are not good. Which is why I like the wisdom of Bill Hybels. Right? He gave the 10, 10, 10, 10, 80 principle. What is the 10, 10, 80 that Bill Hybels was, was advocating? It basically states that once we get our income, we will immediately take out 10% for our giving. Then we take another 10% for our intentional saving. Then with the other 80, you may be free to dispose of them. And here the wise man in Proverbs 28 tells us, a faithful man will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. So understand this, we, if we save faithfully, if we look at wealth and spend what God has given to us faithfully, we will end up being blessed. But having a get-quick mentality will really kill us or, or destroy us financially. That's why Solomon goes on to say, dishonest money windows away, but he who gathers money little by little make it grow. So contrary to popular saying, money does not grow on trees. We need to put our money to work over time. So little by little, our savings will grow. So start young if you are young. Not too many of us here are young. Those who are young, start young. right? That is good wisdom. So develop that virtue of proportional giving. So being a stingy person is not good. Being a spendthrift is not nice either, not correct either. So the third thing we can do, be a steward. What does it mean to be a steward? Being a steward means when we, that we recognize that we do not own. We do not own what we have, but we are only managing for someone who has entrusted the money to us. If we believe that all God is a giver, giver of all good gifts, then all that we have are entrusted to us by God as to how we will steward what He entrusted to us to bring glory to His name. So, learn to have a, a budget, right? A good budget. What is a good biblical bu budget? What is for your consideration? First priority, right? Set money aside and give to the Lord. Then, look at how we can put some cash aside for savings. Then, certainly, Right? Honor your parents and, and, and we take care of family. Put aside money for family needs. You can, if you're thinking of saving, insurance is, is one way of putting aside money. I always say that if you, are, if you are really, if you know the heart of God, there are three groups of people right, that really touch the heart of God. They are the widows, right? the orphans, and the aliens the poor and the needy, the disadvantaged. I call them blue chip shares. You want to invest in real returns in heaven. You give to people in such needs. Well, you can put money in investments. So that's how we can have a decent, sound, biblical budget. So I want to leave us this evening with something that, that, uh, that all of us can seek to do with the wealth that God has given to all of us. It is found in Luke chapter 16. I'm not sure whether you know the story. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus told this great parable about a very smart, very smart manager. But he, although he was smart, he was really dishonest. And because he was dishonest, he was about to lose his job. So what he did when he knew that he was about to lose his job, he called, right? He called all of his master's debtors and started cutting their debts. And then give them discounts some more. So he bring in one who owns a master for 900 measures of all. He cut it 50%, make it just 450. Then to the next person who owned 100 bushels of wheat, he says uh, 1,000 bushels of wheat, 20% off, make it 800. And the master 
instead of punishing him for his dishonesty, instead commanded him for being shrewd, for being wise. I don't know whether when you read this parable that you struggle with this, that we have a problem with this. Why? It seems that, that Jesus seems to be commanding dishonesty. But what is Jesus trying to tell us in this great parable? What was the basic lesson that the Lord is wanting us to learn? Right? Relationship is more important than money. That is the basic lesson. And what Jesus is saying is this, I tell you, use your wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That is what Jesus is trying to tell us. Building the right this, uh, the relationship with the money that we have that will ensure that in time to come, we will be welcomed into eternity. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, say, for if you do these things, you will never, never fall and you receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So if you are to ask the Lord, how would you want me to use my wealth? I think this is what he will tell us. Go. Go and make friends with your wealth with eternity in mind. In short, we can send in advance friends, friends that we, we are investing our wealth in relationships and friends whom we can send in advance to heaven. So that when we get there, there will be many people who will richly welcome us into our eternal dwelling. And we would do that. We would invest in what would be sent ahead into eternity. I suspect that some of us, if we are doing that, when we get to heaven, we will be surprised as to who is welcoming us. There could be an African boy who comes up to you and welcomes you as a friend. Then you say, do I know you? And the boy will say, you have never met me before, but the $300 that you gave to the open ministry, right? And that ministry was what brought me a Bible. And through that Bible, I, come to, I came to know the Lord. And that's why I'm here today. You may meet an Indian boy or Indian girl from India who come to us. The reason I'm here is because you faithfully gave $100 every month to that orphan home. And you'll see that orphan home, a Christian orphan home that tells me the story of Jesus. And because of that, this is why I am here. You get the idea? So can we picture this? Let us learn. Let us learn to be wise, to use our wife to make friends that we can send in advance into heaven. Don't ever get this crazy idea that in heaven there's this big, big, enormous, gigantic development bank of heaven. And we think that every time I give a dollar, then we have a credit of 10. Each time I give $100, I get a credit of 1,000, right? It does not work that way. Why? In heaven, money useless. We don't need money in heaven. The Bible is very clear that there are only two things, only two things that will last forever. What are the two things? They are the Word of God as well as the souls of men. So when we understand that, we are able to understand the parable in Luke 16, isn't it? Jesus wasn't commanding dishonesty. What is wrong is wrong. But Jesus saw in his dishonest work that there is a lesson to be learned. So let us ask God to give us a big heart, a big heart for our souls, a big heart for the lost. Let us ask God to help us, to give us a generous heart to give so that when it comes to spending money for the lost, then we are free to do so. Which is why, based on this, philosophically, I don't think as a church we'll ever spend millions of dollars to have a building of our own. Nor will we spend 
tens or hundreds of thousands on a weekly basis to go into a posh and good hotel function room or whatever. But when it comes to giving to ministries, to outreach work, to evangelism work, to the missions, let us learn, let's allow God to increase our heart, to become big, so that the more we receive, the more we are able to do that, to give, and do it readily, because we want to make friends, as, make as many friends as possible. We do want to see many saved, so that we can send them to heaven in advance. And when we do that, we are really preparing for ourselves a rich welcome when we get into heaven. So, brothers and sisters, this is financial wisdom. Let us learn and put that into practice. Let us learn to look at the wealth that we have, the possessions that we have, with an eternal mindset, with a kingdom mindset. Let's pray together. Father, oftentimes we use the words, say the words that all good gifts come from you. We even say that, Lord, what we have is really yours. But yet, Father, you are the one who looks at the intent of our heart, the purity of our heart. And Father, we, often, we would confess that oftentimes we are much more concerned about satisfying and meeting our needs first. Lord, we do have responsibility and that's not wrong in itself. But Father, tonight we ask of you, teach us, give us a mindset that has eternity in view in regards to what you have entrusted to us. Teach us as a church to give to the needs of missions, to any ministries that bring glory to your kingdom that will bring many into heaven. And Father, we also want to ask of you, grant us a heart that is contented. That we are content with what you have given to you, us. May it be little, may it be much. Teach us to be grateful so that, Father, there is always that joy and that gladness in our hearts. So teach us, Lord, tutor us in this area that we will be financially wise in managing what you have entrusted to us, that we may be found faithful stewards. To this we pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.